philosophy of the Rene Chapman Cards Foundation when I started to really study the topic is to what extent the DOD was doing some very innovative things. So it wasn't a case of, well, you know, we're, we're defending America's interests and, and we can't, you know, obviously allow ourselves anything like work-life balance because the military was a firm believer in it and chief among them was uh, or one of the chief spokesmen for it is Admiral Mullen. So um, it was interesting to see the Navy had put in a lot of work-life uh, programs for their people. They were allowing workplace flexibility and different kinds of programs. So there were a lot of places where people were looking at work in different ways. And it told me that if they can do it, then we can do it too. Thanks, Margo. I, I think some of this, the difference between the military and the Department of State, although uh, we, we have similar, similar yet, yet different functions, uh, was articulated in Charles Ray's article in the Foreign Service Journal. And that is that the focus on work life, management by walking around, uh, taking time to smell the roses, that has to come from the top. The Department of State, the wonderful organization that it is, with incredibly talented people, has a culture of workaholism, if that is the term, being workaholics. And it's because the work that we do, we feel is so important. The work that the military does is also important. But the military managers give people the okay to have a life. And I go back about eight or nine years when Colin Powell was Secretary of State, ex-military. And I remember one of the town hall meetings, because he was trying to address, he was very aware of the strong work culture, overwhelming work culture at the Department of State. And he said to the gathering, you are not going to impress me if you are here 8 o'clock tonight working. You will impress me if you are home with your family and you are at a PTA meeting and you are at your kid's soccer game. But you're not going to impress me if you're here 8 o'clock tonight because you've been here all day. Now, we don't have enough people at the State Department saying this, I guess, is what it amounts to. So this is why I think it'll take a long time to change the work culture at the Department of State uh, to make it okay to be family friendly, to make it okay to take off time to go to your kid's soccer game and take your child to the doctor. But it's a work in progress, and I think we're very fortunate to have someone heading up an office of work life who understands a lot of these issues and someone who has an advocacy bone. So uh, I think we're moving in the right direction, but that, that's, that's my personal opinion. And I would like to turn it over to the audience because I'm sure you have a lot of questions and this is your chance to ask some of the experts here. And Donna, would, would you be, well, actually I'll come down and I'll, I'll, I'll carry the microphone around. Yeah, okay. I can all seems that you've gone on from there and there are even more things available. 
now, the one part of the system that is, was at that time retrograde, and I wonder whether it still is, is the promotions. Uh, you are not allowed to mention any of this stuff in your EDR to justify having taken a particular assignment or a particular the fact that you have been in Washington for a long time, as which was my case. We both did it. Both, both things happened in my case. And there I would receive um, letters from the board saying, you know, you have very good reviews. We wanted to promote you, but we can't. We felt we couldn't promote you because you've been too long in Washington or you hadn't uh, taken that hardship post. And, what, 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 what. and I was unable, I was not allowed to tell them the reason. And so I went quite a long time uh, after, after this, these first things happened, at the rate that I was when they happened, before I was promoted to the next rank. And interestingly enough, uh, that board that promoted me happened to have on it a colleague and friend of mine who knew me and knew why I had made the peculiar assignment decisions that I had made. And I don't know whether it was legal for him to do so, but he told the board my story, and I was promoted. And so uh, I'm wondering if this, if, if anybody's looking at this, if this has changed, if, if, if this is ever going to change. It, it, it seems to me that until we get work life acknowledged in the promotion process, we haven't really gone the whole way. There's no one here from uh, PE. But this is a, this this uh, question I think should be raised to the director general. I'm sure we'll write up some some report after this uh, discussion, and I think that is definitely something that should be raised with the director general. I don't it's know. Like if Paul's, if, I if, yeah, I know. But there are other people. Yeah, I'm sure it's still probably still an issue. So uh, that's something that PE probably has an answer for. Yeah. But uh, there's no one here to, to articulate. Susan, I don't know if you have thoughts on this or if you have insider knowledge? <laughs> well, I mean, we do ask that those negotiate on promotion precepts every year. So there are opportunities to, you know, discuss these kinds of issues. Um, but we need to, in order to be able to really have a strong case, and this negotiation is a constructive and collaborative, it's not an adversarial thing. So we need to be able to come to management and come with facts, figures, or stats, or whatever, all of which are very difficult to get. Um, there, as, as you were talking, you know, I was thinking a lot of aspects of our current structure. I mean, we have inherited, like the rest of the federal government, essentially the um, institutions that were put in place in the post-World War II system with most of the personnel systems and most of the you know, approaches to things. And we have not ever been able to really reform those. We've adjusted them, you know, and uh, tweaked them here and there and, and improved them in some areas or made them a little more flexible. But essentially, that's what we're working with. We have uh, a very sort of workaholic kind of culture. And I have a bigger question, you know, which is, uh, are there um, successful examples of what it takes to change a corporate culture? In other words, how does that happen? How long does it take? Does it start from the top? Does it start from the bottom? Does it require both sides? I mean, you know, what are the stimuluses? What are the do's and don'ts? Where has it worked well? You know, what were the secrets of that success and so forth? That's a whole other topic, you know, to go into. But we have the, aside from the, you know, workaholic, aside from the under-resourcing for two decades so that we don't have enough people for the positions we have, aside from the expanding mission, aside from the new security constraints which make everything harder than it was before in many, many ways, and which is emerging as an issue where the security mission balance just really needs to be reevaluated. Now, either we have to ratchet back the mission, or we have to be willing to take more risk, or we have to know how to manage the risk differently, or, you know, all this. Then we have the upper out system, which, you know, is depends how we apply that. And it reinforces a competitive system where, I mean, first we have musical chairs because as each level you have fewer positions and even if all the people have done well and are qualified, we've invested in them, they're talented, uh, still there's only so many chairs. And so it doesn't mean that everybody who wasn't promoted isn't a perfectly fine, you know, foreign service uh, person or hasn't done well in what they've been doing. Um, it means that that's 